Do you know this man? He's the most famous cowboy in Texas. And last week he found himself in Washington, D.C., surrounded by redskins. Tom Landry and the Dallas Cowboys handed the Washington Redskins their only regular season loss of 1982 and had beaten the Skins six straight times. But after taking a three to nothing lead, the Cowboys let control of the NFC Championship game slip into the hands of Redskins fullback John Riggins. Behind his offensive line, affectionately known as the Hogs, Riggins cowpunched a series of holes in the doomsday defense and branded the visitors for 65 first half yards. Washington ran the ball over 70% of the time as quarterback Joe Theismann threw sparingly, but going to great lengths to locate his core of unheralded receivers. Tight end Don Warren, number 85, is one of several lesser known Redskin receivers. Another is 5 foot 7 inch Alvin Garrett, number 89, who has made this Super Bowl tournament his personal playground after replacing the injured Art Monk. Weissman culminated the Washington scoring drive when he spotted yet another new face. First-year wide receiver Charlie Brown, number 87. Pro Bowl designate Charlie Brown lifted Washington to their first score and a 7-3 lead. He's building his reputation one touchdown at a time. The no-name Washington defense fattened their reputation by keeping Dallas runners on a starvation diet, setting speed traps for Tony Dorsett and company, and limiting the Cowboy ground game to just 31 first-half yards. Then the Cowboys began making the kind of mistake that is quite out of character for this playoff condition team. Rookie kick returner Rod Hill bobbled a redskin punt and the ball was recovered for an apparent Washington touchdown. Despite vigorous lobbying by the Redskin defense, the ball was brought back out to the original point of contact. Fortunately for the Cowboys, the referee's call was correct. The rule states the kicking team may recover, but not advance unless the receiving team had possession. In Rod Hill's case, touching the ball did not mean possession. The ball was then returned to the point at which it was first touched. So it was Redskins ball at the Dallas 11-yard line. It took Washington four plays to stick the ball back in the end zone. Appropriately, the scoring chores were handled by John Riggins. But equal credit for the touchdown must go to those beloved hogs, the Washington offensive line that rolled like a wave, breaking on Doomsday's doorstep. The score extended the Redskin lead to 14-3. On the ensuing kickoff, 
Cowboy return man Rod Hill again became the center of attention on another unusual call. Hill began his move out of the end zone, then decided otherwise and backed back in. At first, it looked like a safety when Hill put his knee to the ground. But while his foot did indeed touch the goal line, the ball did not fully break the plane of the goal line. The entire football must cross the goal line, not just a portion of it. So after each team got an education on the subtleties of the NFL rule book, Dallas quarterback Danny White experienced anything but a subtle touch from the Redskins' pass rush when defensive end Dexter Manley zeroed in on a stunt. The blow left White senseless, and the play was his last of the 1982 season. The Redskin defense had rained on White and the Cowboys, and as the Washington sky threatened rain as well, Dallas headed for the nearest storm cellar, trailing at the half, 14 to three. Trailing 14 to three at the start of the third quarter of the NFC Championship game, the Dallas Cowboys needed a big play to sway the momentum in their direction. And on the second half kickoff, the Cowboys special teams almost provided one. Dallas forced returner Mike Nelms to cough up the football, but in the wild scramble for the fumble, the Cowboys came up empty-handed. However, when the Redskins were unable to move the ball from deep in their own territory, Gary Hogaboom, number 14, who replaced the injured Danny White, took advantage of the good field position. Hogaboom, who until last Saturday had completed only three passes in his three-year NFL career, quickly proved that his right arm was good for more than carrying a clipboard. Hogaboom's touchdown pass to Drew Pearson tightened the score to 14 to 10. But just as it seemed the Cowboys had lassoed the Redskins and were ready to haul them in, Nelms, number 21, slipped out of the noose and broke away on a 76-yard return. To avoid the Cowboys' rope, on offense, the Redskins used rollout passes as Theismann's lateral movement helped keep him out of the clutches of the Dallas front four. But as Washington closed in on the Cowboy end zone, their strategy became more bullish, thanks to ox-like running back John Riggins. Trailing 21 to 10 in the third quarter of the NFC title game was a tough situation for a greenhorn like Hogaboom. But the Cowboy quarterback circled the wagons and bravely battled back. Hogaboom's second touchdown pass, a 23-yarder to Butch Johnson, cut the Redskin lead to four. While the offense pumped points into the scoreboard, linebacker Bob Brunig, number 53, and the Cowboy defense stopped Washington's offense by finally stopping Riggins.
Shutting down the Redskin running game forced Washington into passing situations, giving Dallas the opportunity to tee off on quarterback Joe Theismann. In the final quarter, Dallas still trailed by only four points, 21 to 17. And the young quarterback no doubt harbored grand illusions of coming off the bench to lead America's team to their sixth Super Bowl appearance. Unfortunately, those thoughts began to fade when number 55, Mel Kaufman's interception, set up a Mark Mosley field goal that boosted the Redskins' lead to 24 to 17. Hogaboom's first mistake cost the Cowboys three points. His second cost them a trip to Pasadena. Dexter Manley's tipped pass fell into the large arms of Daryl Grant, number 77, who rambled 10 yards into the end zone for the game-clinching touchdown. The Redskins' 31-17 win marked their first victory over the Cowboys since 1978 and earned the team from the nation's capital their second NFC championship. While the heroic Hogaboom and the rest of the Cowboys suffered the disappointment of their third consecutive NFC title defeat, the Redskins celebrated the 10-year anniversary of their first Super Bowl appearance by earning another opportunity to play for the World Championship of Professional Football. Last Saturday, Washington set out to do two things, gain the respect of the NFL and secure a berth in Super Bowl 17. Last Saturday, they accomplished both. Miami natives did a rain dance that produced the worst possible field conditions for the AFC championship. The muck and mire dictated a day made for defense, and in this new NFL era of space age offense, the game was a throwback to those horse and buggy days of the late 60s and early 70s. Although both the Jets and Dolphins hit hard, the level of play was as sloppy as the field. This was a game that would turn on breaks and mistakes, not great plays. And for one team, Super Bowl dreams would die in the rain and mud of the Orange Bowl. The field neutralized both teams' major offensive weapons. The Dolphins' Andre Franklin, number 37, rushed for only 44 yards while the Jets' Freeman McNeil, who gained 297 yards in two previous playoff games, managed just 46. The Dolphins double teamed to number 99 Mark Gastineau to neutralize his unique ability to pursue all over the field. This technique was effective when it was employed, when it was not, even a quick quarterback like David Woodley was easily tracked down by the all-pro defensive end. While the Jets' defense is overpowering in spots, Don Shula's unit, known as the Killer Bees, is the top-rated defense in the NFL. The bees buzzed around quarterback Richard Todd, whose longest completion of the day was a mere 18-yarder to Lamb Jones. The Miami pass rush, led by number 58, Kim Bocamper, hounded Todd into the poorest day of his career. The Dolphins' intricate zone defense rattled the Jack quarterback, whose forced throws yielded five interceptions. 
Miami quarterback David Woodley, who stood poised and assured in two previous playoff victories, was just as tentative and confused as Todd. And the results of his passes were just as disastrous. Woodley threw two interceptions in the first half, the second one killing the only legitimate scoring opportunity either team enjoyed in the first 30 minutes. Some people get worked up about nothing, which was exactly what the first half produced, a scoreless tie. As Johnny Carson used to say about growing up in Nebraska, it was about as exciting as watching corn grow. The old standard, something's got to give, would have been an appropriate tune to play as the second half began. The Jets offense was hoping to unleash an irresistible force, but the Dolphins defense proved to be an immovable object. Something gave, and number 77, A.J. Dewey, did the taking. Dewey's interception put the Dolphins in business on the New York 48-yard line, but it looked like their business was doomed to failure when number 37, Andra Franklin, fumbled the ball. The Jets' apparent recovery was nullified when it was ruled that Franklin's forward motion was stopped before he coughed up the ball. The Jets were a trifle perturbed by the call, and it showed when they protested that a David Woodley pass was caught out of bounds by number 82, Duriel Harris. The protest earned New York an unsportsmanlike penalty that cost them another 15 yards. After the smoke had cleared, ex-Jet Woody Bennett, number 34, burned his former teammates. Bennett's seven-yard run up the middle provided the game with its long overdue first touchdown, and it gave Woody an opportunity to demonstrate that his playing days near the Great White Way had well prepared him for the proper reaction to the spotlight. The curtain call was crisp, but the spike was not smoothly accomplished. Another look at Bennett's score reveals that Jeff Taves, number 60, pulled from his right guard position to deliver a key block. Miami had drawn first blood from a Jet defensive unit stocked with highly publicized performers. By contrast, the Dolphin defense has toiled in virtual anonymity during the year. But these new no-names left a lasting impression on Richard Todd will likely be seeing A.J. Dewey and his nightmares throughout the coming off season. Dewey was a veritable chameleon lining up at both inside and outside linebacker, as well as a defensive end. It was as an end that Dewey produced an NFL record third interception that increased the Dolphins' lead to 14 to nothing. Dewey's 35-yard scoring run came early in the fourth quarter, but while time was running out on the Jets, their defense played with the same kind of intensity they had shown throughout the game. Woodley learned the hard way that it takes more than a two-touchdown lead to close down the sack exchange. Greg Buttle, number 51, capped one of his best days as a pro with a final period interception. But like the other New York takeaways in the game, this proved to be another instance of opportunity knocking on the Jets' door. 
and finding no one home. The killer bees continued to sting Todd, and when he threw his record-tying fifth interception, it was abundantly clear that he was not destined to solve the myriad of problems posed by Miami's defense. Since the Jets were unable to find the answers on the field, they sought guidance elsewhere. But there were no last-minute miracles forthcoming. The Dolphins ended the game with a 14-0 victory that gave them their first AFC championship since 1973. The confident hometown folks who had these t-shirts made up early obviously knew beforehand that something's got to give the Dolphins a berth in Super Bowl 17.